So in discussion of how to think about placeholders and placeholder geometry in Revit, I thought we'd take a look at this sort of ridiculous but slightly complicated piece of geometry where you've got an underlying surface that makes this sort of swoopy shape and then you've got a series of elements that are populating the whole surface and then underlying the whole thing there's uh, some curves that create the underlying surface. And there's different ways to sort of break down complexity of the models in Revit and Vasari and I'm just going to dissect this model a little bit to show some things about that. Um, so if I delete this whole element what we can see is that we've got three curves one two three that you can actually think of as placeholders themselves these curves you, these curves you can select each one of them and create a form th from them yourself like that and the way that I did it was I used these three are reference lines and if I made them out of regular model lines I'd actually have a fairly different effect when I made a form from them in that I would make a form and those lines if I deleted this whole element would be consumed so there's some advantages to do it, some not so advantages some not so advantageous aspects of it but in terms of talking about placeholders it's kind of fun to talk about reference lines as themselves being placeholders that is you can tear up and tear down these things and uh, still have your underlying skeleton that essentially holds the place for your geometry. So now I've got my surface and I know that eventually I want to populate it with some kind of panel that's going to create the whole thing, make it buildable. And what I can do initially is I can divide the surface and then this creates in fact a placeholder for individual cells that would eventually be populated by geometry. And the advantage of this not being completely detailed with lots of geometry yet is that it's still pretty lightweight and I can manipulate my underlying curves and have some fairly quick regeneration. As I start adding information to this, it gets a little heavier and a little slower. Um, right now it's still pretty zippy. I can do things like I can change the density of the grid. I can start playing with the patterning of it. And all of my stuff so far is really just placeholders for eventual real geometry. You know, I can start looking at patterns like that or looking at triangular patterning and this sort of thing. And it's all still pretty lightweight again. I can start stretching it around. Now if I go back and I say, well, you know what, I really want it to be rectangular in the end. I can pick a rectangle. And I say, well, I know that it's going to be populated by this sort of spiky hedgehog thing which we can see from from the parametric patterns website that we're going to be going for in the end this sort of spiky thing so I'm going to start off by saying well what exactly do I want my spikes to be like you know I've got uh, loaded in a basic um, spike which if I open this up this is a panel that would get placed in that divided surface, is the essence of a spike, that is a line that is shooting up from one space on the panel. And I can start just populating my surface with this very simplistic spike. And because it's so simple, it's pretty lightweight, and I can start making initial decisions, like I can see that my surface has been formed so that everything's facing inwards rather than outwards. So I can go in and I can start manipulating this surface so that it's pointed in the right direction, for instance. Um, with surfaces, there's no real inside or outside. You, know, you might assume something, but that doesn't mean that the machine assumes it. So now I've got my spikes, and you know maybe I want to go back in and say, well, my spikes should be longer. That's not a good spike, so I want to make it longer. And again, I'm working in a very sort of abstracted relationship so that I have quick regeneration. But even at this stage, it actually starts to get a little heavy to start making moves like this. You know, it's pretty quick. But if I want to actually make quicker moves like that and really start yanking this thing around, I'd like to be able to toggle back and forth between um, having this sort of developed surface and something that is sort of lightweight so I can really have that responsiveness. So I can toggle back to my sort of no pattern state and I can also look at this surface 
again, back in my sort of um, different ways of abstracting what that looks like. So here I've got my nodes, which just are basically each one of those points is a placeholder for eventual geometry that would show up on it. Or I can go back up here to surface representation and I can toggle it back to you know where I started, which is the original surface, like that. But eventually I want to start adding more detail to this guy and say, okay, well I've got this basic cone geometry, which I made in another panel here. And this starts to be my sort of hedgehoggy shape. And I can go and I can replace that in where I used to pick stick. Now I'm going to pick cone. And it's going to take a little bit longer to regenerate because again, I'm adding more geometry and I'm adding more information. So every time I do that, Revit has to do more calculations and do more thinking about it. And I might even be saying, okay, now I know that I want it to be a little denser. So I'll increase the density. And now it's going to have to crank again on this to sort of regenerate that. And if I decide that I really want to do some iterations and play back and forth and back and forth, I can go back to different sort of lighter weight states where I can do that sort of quicker manipulation. So now let's say that I'm getting really close and I've got my sort of ridiculous panel here with lots of geometry in it. It's got you know cones and sweeps and it's got this other nested divided surface in it, a ball. I can go in and I can sub that out for my cone 1 is going to become cone 2 and it's going to crank and it's going to sit there and you see 1% and I might have to pause to let this go but let's see so see now I've got a fully populated surface that has lots of geometry on it. But now if I decide, you know what, I kind of want to manipulate this underlying surface by yanking that. If I go and I yank that uh, point right here to change my spline, it's going to be a pain in the ass because it's going to have to regenerate all of that stuff. So what do I do if I want to make sort of more iterative changes? Well, I can go back to what I had before. Um, I can go back to no pattern and I can make my lightweight changes. Um, say I want to go back in and I realize, you know, I've got my underlying lines, which I just sort of sketched out right away, are, you know, out of, uh, are a little bit skewed. Well, I can just hide that, oops. I can hide that element and I can go in and I can make sort of large scale manipulations Let's see, is that going to be square? There's square. I can add my parameters. Again, I can move quickly because I'm not manipulating all of that nested geometry. And I can add stuff like that and god damn it. Yeah, add my parameters like this. Call that so I can start fine-tuning what this geometry is. And again, go back to my underlying divided surface and say, okay, I want this to be back up. And now I can just turn back on all of my geometry. And now I'll wait for this one big regeneration, but I don't have to wait for regenerations every time I make some of those small changes. And being able to move back and forth between these states is pretty important if you want to do any kind of iteration during the early stages of your design. So here I've got my geometry all set up again. I've got my parameters set up so I know everything's equal. And I only had to regenerate this whole piece of geometry two times in the whole process. Once to first try it out and then once to get a sort of final state of it. 